Hello, I'm David Hewson, the very lucky writer who was given the privilege of turning a fantastic TV series, The Killing, into three books. The last of which is now with us, The Killing 3. So what I'd like to do now is look back on the last three years I've spent in the company of this extraordinary woman, Sarah Lunt, and ask why did she fascinate us so much and what was it really all about? And in many ways, the quest for Sarah Lund comes down to a simple question. Who is she? Where did she come from? And where is she going? Let's tackle this the way she would and look for some clues. Here we are in The Killing One, the first time we ever meet her. And she is in a quandary. She's about to go to Sweden with her lover, a bit of a jerk called Bengt. But at the same time, there's a murder case involving a young girl, Nana Burke Larson and Lunt, as we will come to see over the next two series, is not good at letting go. She's also a little bit delusional, as that jumper tells you. Basically what it's saying is, yes, I could run off and live in the woods in Sweden playing a guitar and being a bit of a hippie. I don't actually need to be a murder detective. She's never going to Sweden. We know that, even if she doesn't. And at the beginning of Killing 2, things are pretty much the same. She's lost in some tiny little port called Gedza, checking passports, away from Copenhagen, missing the job she really wants to be doing, burying herself in dreariness when really she should be chasing murderers. Five or six years on in The Killing 3, it's even worse. She's wearing a tie. She thinks she's going to get a job pushing paper clips in an office because she's sick of being a detective. With the killing, you should always look at early scenes for a clue about what's actually going on. And there's a fantastic one in the very first episode of The Killing 3. A body's been found in a scrapyard on the very edge of Copenhagen. Or rather bits of a body, because it's pretty gruesome stuff. Just the kind of thing you'd expect Lunt to be fascinated by, except she isn't. She can't wait to get back to the office for her long service medal in an interview for the office job. And on the way out, she tries to buy a cheap wheelbarrow. Yes, the world's greatest detective has taken up gardening. So what exactly do we know about Sarah Lund? Well, she's incredibly observant. Those beady eyes don't miss a thing. She's persistent too. When other people give up, she carries on and often spots things that they've overlooked. When she sees you in her sights, she's never, ever going to let go. But that's the professional side of her. What about the woman? Well, she's very uncommunicative with her colleagues. She doesn't open up to them at all. She really does not pick boyfriends well. She's an attractive woman, but if she realises it, she just doesn't care. And there's an almost childish impulsiveness about her. She will ask for coffins to be opened, for lakes to be drained, with no thought whatsoever as to the consequences. And then there's family. There's a very instructive scene partway through Killing One that I think tells you an awful lot about Lund and her situation. She's at home with a mother with whom she has a very difficult relationship and her young son, who's 12 or 13, Mark. The mother is having a go at her, as she clearly often does, because Mark has got a girlfriend and she thinks that Lund doesn't even know. Lunt blatantly lies and says she did know, but unfortunately Mark overhears and stomps off out into the street like the surly teenager he is. There, there is an astonishing confrontation where she insists she is interested in his life, and he says simply, you're only interested in dead people. To understand Lunt better, we also need to look at her world. These stories are shaped by three principal components. The first I'd just call simply society. It's the state, it's politics, it's police, it's the organised government that's supposed to look after us. The second is more subtly portrayed, but it's there in every killing story. And it's religion, it's the church, it's ministers, it's rituals of life and death. And the third we've touched on already. It's family. 
mothers and fathers, sons and daughters, the smallest, most precious unit of society that there is. Politics are never very far from these stories, and it's clear, as we hear in Hamlet, that there really is something rotten in the state of Denmark. In Killing One, we have the wily and morally dubious Charles Hartman trying to become mayor of Copenhagen at any cost. At the end of Killing Two, we have the Justice Minister Thomas Buch confronting the Prime Minister himself with evidence that he was involved in murders. Book's answer is to tell the world and expose the rottenness at the core of the state, but then he discovers that actually the world around him probably already knows. This is a depiction of politics as Machiavellian to the core. Religion's more subtly handled in the killing, but it is always there. I'll never forget when I first went out to see Søren Sveistrup, the creator of the series, in Copenhagen, and we talked about the kitchen in the very first series. Here it is with Penelope sitting by the table. This is a very carefully designed room, those pictures of the family on the table, the green plants in the window, and if you look carefully, the shape of a cross cast by the window panes. The Burke Larsons are an ordinary working class family, and they have some expectation of faith in the church, but this doesn't last. There's an extraordinary scene later on where Tyson and Pernille go to church to discuss the funeral of their daughter with a rather sanctimonious priest. Pernille, who I think is absolutely magnificent throughout, gets madder and madder as this goes on. And finally, when the priest tells her that really things are okay because Nana's with God now, she snaps. Nana is her daughter. She's not supposed to be with God She's supposed to be at home with her family. You can't escape family in the killing. It's at the heart of everything that happens here. The extraordinary performances of Tyson Pernille in series one. The touching but fractured soldiers family in Killing Two. And in the final series, the Zoytens, one of the richest families in Denmark. But even that can't protect them from the nightmare to come. Lund's last case is a dark, twisting, shocking final chapter to this story. Once again, it has three different linked storylines. The first is the kidnapping of a young girl, Zoyton's daughter. By whom? How? Why? And can Lund save her? The second thread of the narrative is the Zoyton family. How will they cope with their daughter's disappearance? Will it bring them further together or simply tear them further apart? And of course, we have politics. Another election, another slightly dodgy politician who, with an eye for women. In this case, though, Christian Kamper is fighting for the most important position in Denmark, that of Prime Minister itself. And we have an added complication, Mark, Lunt's son, no longer a surly kid, he's a surly young man, one with plenty of problems of his own, some of which he certainly blames on his mother. Now I'm writing a book here, an adaptation, I'm not photocopying the television. So it's my job to change, to move, to delete, as I see fit, in order to produce a story that works as a book. The TV was produced episode by episode, moving forward as the narrative grew. That's exactly the opposite to the way I'm writing, because I have the benefit of hindsight, and I can look at these three series and try to link them in a way that's simply impossible on television, which means I can make big changes if I think the story needs it, and this, I felt, did. There are a lot of resonances with Killing One in Killing Three, and I wanted to make the most of them. There's a politician fighting for his political life, parents trying to make sense of what appears to be a terrible loss. I wanted to produce a book that was the final episode in a trilogy, which links across the narratives, and the more I watched it on television, the more I became convinced that we needed a very big cast change. And it's this. The wannabe Prime Minister of Denmark is no longer Christian Camper, he's Trills Hartman, who we last saw newly installed as mayor of Copenhagen. 
The fact I made this change is no criticism of the actor or the script or what happened on TV. My job is to get the best book I possibly can. And bringing Hartman back added an awful lot to the story. It means we see some continuation from series one. And it adds to the tension because he remembers lunch. She nearly put him in jail. Will she do it again? And finally, it reminds us once again that this is about the state of the world and the state of Denmark. So a missing girl, a family in turmoil, and a politician with uncertain allegiances. There we have The Killing Three. The introduction of Charles Hartman apart, the book pretty much follows the TV storyline. Until, of course, we get to the end. As readers of the earlier books will know, these are different. I change them. And that's not for the sake of it. It's not to add some kind of novelty. It's because books aren't the same as TV. A reader is not the same as someone sitting in an audience. Readers demand resolution. They demand answers. It's not enough, for example, to know who killed Nana Burke Larson. We also need to know why. TV is less fixated with endings. In a way, TV is as much about the journey as it is about the destination. In a book, I simply can't do that. And if this is a trilogy, at the end of it, I have to close down the question, who is Sarah Lund? What drives her? What is her role in all of this? There are 40 hours of television in all here, and I've watched every second more than once. And I think the central thesis of The Killing can be summarised as this. The state won't save you. The police won't save you. God won't save you. In fact, what we think of as society won't save you. The one worthwhile asset we have in our lives is the most precious and most fragile of all, the family. Let's go back to Killing One again and look at that scene with Mark and Lund outside the house where he says to her, you're only interested in dead people. And at that stage, he's right. But by the end of Killing Three, Lund has learned to think differently. She's become aware that family, her own family, is the most valued asset of all. And in the end, Lund possesses for the first time some self-knowledge. She discovers herself. She realises that her role is not about her own happiness. It's about sacrifice of her freedom, her career, her life if need be, in order to protect the one she loves. It's a bleak message, and in a way it's a bleak ending. Though I think the closing scenes in the book perhaps offer a little more in the way of salvation and resolution than we see on TV. This is the end of Lund's journey, and the end of my association with these remarkable TV shows. Writing these books has been a fascinating, educational and highly exciting challenge. I've loved every minute of it, and I have to say, I will miss this extraordinary policewoman from Copenhagen, who can say more by putting her hands on her hips than most of us can manage an entire paragraph. But I think at the end of Killing Three, she's more at one with herself than she ever was at the beginning of Killing One, when she was about to vanish to Sweden with the awful Bengt Rosling. And I, for one, like that idea.